I think we're live. Hello. <laughs> Hi. Um, hello, everyone, and welcome to Small Talks. Uh, this is the last talk of our summer season, which aptly falls on the first day of fall, uh, which is today. So I'm Leilani Lynch, the curator at the Bass, and Small Talks are a chance to get to know more about artists we feature at the museum and what they're working on and what's inspiring them. Um, at the end of the conversation, we'll be taking some questions from the audience, so feel free to add them to the chat at any time, um, or you can wait until the end. And I need to say that Small Talks is made possible by the generous support of Art Bridges, and we really appreciate that, so thank you, Art Bridges. Today, I'm so pleased to be here with our guest, Farley Aguilar. Hi, Farley. Um, I'm just going to read a quick bio for you. Farley Aguilar was born in Managua, Nicaragua, and lives and works in Miami. He has had recent solo exhibitions at Lyles and King in New York, Edel Asante in London, as well as been part of group shows at the Kunstraum in Potsdam, Germany, the Taubman Museum in Virginia, and Ulate Arts in Miami. His works are in the in collections internationally, including the Used Museum in Shanghai, the Bass in Miami, Akron Art Museum in Akron, Ohio, and the Perez, Perez Art Museum, Miami. And one of his works, which we'll talk about later in um, today's conversation, is on view at the Bass now in our open storage exhibition, which is downstairs. So, Farley, how are you? I'm good. <laughs> good. How is the first day of fall treating you? Uh, I was unaware it was fall, but uh, it was cool. <laughs> <laughs> it's hard to it's hard to tell the passing of the seasons in Miami, right? Yes, very true. So we won't get that colder weather until a little bit later on. Um, well, good. That's nice. Nice to spend some time with you this evening. Um, so before we jump into some of the great. Uh, images that you shared with us. I want to ask, because I ask everyone this, a little bit about your origin story, because although I didn't say this is part of your bio today, a lot of the bios that exist about you say that first that you're a self-taught painter. So curious to know who or what are some of your references and what really instigated your exploration of painting? <laughs> Um, uh, <laughs> I mean, I think the first time I made a, I, I made a painting, I was, uh, in, in, in summer school and high school. And, uh, I think that we have an assignment to make like a watercolor. And I remember I made a soccer ball and the, the Lolita in the, in the, in this aquarium here. <laughs> mm -hmm. That's the first time I probably ever made a painting, but I had, I was never, uh, sort of pushed along that route or brought up in sort of an artistic sort of. You know, it, you know, surroundings or anything. And then I think maybe around 20, maybe again, I did a couple of paintings, but again, to no real interest. But uh, by the time I was like about 18 or 20, I was reading a lot and sort of getting into in, in, into a sort of artistic sort of mindset. And uh, I, I, I think at a certain point, I reached the, I, you know, kind of the state that like, I think that that, that I'm not a writer or anything, and also uh, that I'm a very isolated and reclusive person. So it seemed like painting might be a good, ch like, you know, like a career choice. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I'm not sure that has to do with a uh, uh, sort of inspiration, but uh, yeah. I guess something like that. Yeah, that makes sense. And did, you know, you grew up, um, spent a lot of your life here in Miami. Did that impact your work as an artist? And um, how is it kind of, carrying on that practice living here today? Uh, it definitely helps make you more reclusive. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, the heat keeps you indoors, that helps too. Uh, so uh, yeah, I mean, my practice is extremely, you know, kind of personal and introspective. So, it, you know, I'm not exactly sure how any, any place would affect it. Obviously it does, maybe I don't exactly analyze it, but uh, um, I mean, I'm sure it has, you know, it, the colors I use are extremely bright and intense or something. So maybe it has something to do with that. I, I don't know. But uh, <laughs> uh, as far as how the, the environment around me like really affects it, I'm, I'm not exactly, you know, kind of sure, except that it's kind of antagonizing. So maybe that helps. 
Yeah, it could be. <laughs> well, let's. You started talking about the color a little bit. Let's, um, if we can jump into the the slides, and we can start looking at some of your recent work. Um, awesome. Thanks. So you gave us some great images of what you've been working on recently. And so we'll jump in here um, with a very recent work from this year, you know, 2021, I'm not sure when you completed it, um, show it called National Love, which is showing presumably two couples embracing. Can you say more about this work? And um, if were you working on it for a specific project? Sure. Um yeah, this was actually, uh, this show I, th I think just came down like two days ago in Beijing. I had a show with Spurs Gallery in Beijing and this was part of it. So I just completed it probably maybe two months ago or something. Oh, nice. So National Love, uh, I, um, uh, this shows two, two German couples on vacation in 1932. Uh, I just thought it was a very interesting sort of, you know, like dichotomy of, what was going on socially at that time with like free fall of the economy and all sorts of, you know, you know, this turmoil and, and this very sort of relaxed image of people vacationing. And I like kind of like, you know, I, I mean, every image has parallels between the, the source and historical, you know, context of the original source and, 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 and the historical, you know, context now. And that's why obviously I paint, you know, the, the painting. So, I found that way it was really, you know, kind of interesting, and it's obviously, you know, very bright or something. But it's also, you know, the stare, the the stare of the woman in the middle is looking straight okay. at the audience. I think is very strong. So that's some of the ideas behind that one. Yeah, and I, I was also struck. I mean, for the audience that knows your doesn't is less familiar with your work, um, you know, I would say that there's generally a sort of maybe you would call it like dark or like a foreboding quality that inhabits the paintings. But this one seems kind of joyful. Um, but I think the hint was it with the national love, um, like there's sort of a, like you said, there it was an interesting, joyful, relaxed moment in comparison to what was happening at that time in Germany. You said it was 1932? Yes. Yeah, but also if you look at her, like her hand and like, uh, the woman's face, it's, they're kind of in, in, you know, have, you know, there's signs of, you know, unsteadiness and, you know, it's, it's still kind of uncomfortable. And I, I mean, there's, there, there's little things there that are uncomfortable. She's wearing a helmet, you know, I, I think it's called a pickle hope, this mm -hmm. sort of any sort of like military helmet. It's so pink, yeah. Yeah. So even though it's like colorful and, and, and seems sort of joyful, uh, there, there. Also, how how she's uh, she's painted with just the red. It's, it's very brutish and and harsh, and there's a lot of you know uh, of, of grattage. And I mean, you can't really see it on just an image, but uh, she's painted kind of harshly. So even though she seems uh, she seems kind of joyful, it it also reminded me of the Manet kind of painting. I think in the in the Orsay, the um, the 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 something over the the um, the green, I forgot the name of the painting. Mm -hmm. I think um, when the, it's like a, a group of people at a picnic. Yeah, it's the picnic, but it's the yeah. famous one of the nude one. Yeah. It's a very weird, it seems like a fantasy scene or some sort of yeah. male fantasy scene or something. So it kind of reminded me of that. And she, in the original source image, had clothes and I took them off. So it sort of imagined me as a, uh, I, I imagined that as a military sort of imagining or maybe like a male imagining too. So mm. there's aspects. Mm. Too. I'm sorry, I forgot the name of the thing. <laughs> no, it's okay. You're on the spot, um, but yeah, maybe you can also talk a little bit about the about the process, right? You reference like you use reference images, um, often found photos, um, things that you find through your 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 research. How what is that process? How do you find these images that become the sources of the paintings? Uh, I usually have some sort of topic that I want to deal with or some sort of image like, you know, like the one that's at the past, like a boy holding a flag, something mm -hmm. very, uh, they can be seen as sort of, you know, totally innocuous, sort of un uninteresting, but they carry within them sort of a very heavy sort of ritual and a lot of, of, of the tradition that has uh, uh, this ideology kind of built into it where I think they can, 
they're a metaphor for a lot, even though at face value they seem almost, uh, uh, you know, just mundane or something. Mm -hmm. So I'll, I'll, I'll look up something, you know, like vacation images from the 1930s or something, and you'll get a bunch of things. And then there's certain there's certain things that just jump at you and that seem like uh, like they would be important uh, outside of the context of, of the actual source. And that's how I usually pick them. Mm -hmm. Right. I mean, especially when you're looking at images of the past, kind of with that distance, um, these images that are capturing the everyday, you can really suss out some a lot of significance of the context. Like you were saying, we have this global view of what was happening in the world at that time. Um, but at the moment that the original photo was captured, it was just sort of this very yeah, exactly. um, innocuous really scene. Uh-huh. Right. Yeah, and, and I think the next work that we have, um, we actually have the source image for, which we can toggle back and forth between, right? Um, but let's go back to the painting. I'm curious, um, this is called Officer 1941, also from this year, which I believe I saw the, um, the work in progress when I was in your studio earlier in the year. Can you say, can you talk about who, um, who is this person who's kind of the officer in the foreground of the in, of the image, um, and and yeah, what's going on here? Uh, yes, uh, yeah. So the officer, his name is uh, Samuel J. Battle. Uh, he was the first New York City uh, black, you know, p a police officer. So in that way, it was interesting. He was also. Uh, I, I think his cousin was was also a police officer. So yeah, like this lineage of police officers. But uh, uh, I think this picture is from, from 1941. But he was uh, he got into the police force in 1911, I believe. Uh, yeah. And he had a long career. Was distinguished. He worked in Harlem a lot. He did a lot for you know for like you know the 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 community and things like that. But the the interesting aspect that uh, you know about him, or the psychological depth that I found that was interesting about him, uh, was that he was also used to quell by you know the the politicians a lot of the riots and uprisings in Harlem yeah. in 1935, 41. So he was this sort of uh, you know this dual figure where he's he's breaking a lot of ground, doing a lot of good, but he's also sort of used for, for you know for ends that are you know deceptive or quelling mm. people and not really getting, uh, you know, helping the community at large or in, in or in an amount, you know, space, you know, in, in, in history. So mm -hmm. I found, I found his, uh, the symbol of him, you know, uh, kind of historically, you know, uh, like a very thing, uh, very interesting thing, like, you know, to paint. And, uh, so I kind of painted him, then the shadow, then the flag, then like another shadow. It gets very sort of complicated of you know who he is, what he signifies, or how mm. to do. Right. Yeah. I was, I was going to ask you about the other figures because clearly they're not in the original photo, but you've added sort of these spectral other characters within the the painting. Um, so the the kind of figure right behind him is that just sort is that kind of um, another version of the same self or exactly. Yeah. Yeah. yeah sort of a uh, you know a doubling or a shadow. Or sort of imaginary, you know, kind of self of the same figure, and also when 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 I make the hand like an orange or something, I feel like of something like being being torn, the self being torn away or being broken up in different, you know, different parts or being torn. So, uh, yeah, so it's the same sort of person. It's a shadow, and then him, mm. and then th there's even a shadow behind that yeah. shadow. So uh, it's playing with the self or the historical self and breaking it up into many different sort of, you know, the the, poss uh, the possibilities of how to view. Mm -hmm. And can we, if we can get a bit granular and talk about like color and and medium, how do you build, like how does the, because you, you mentioned very specifically the orange of the hand, like how does the palette begin to form when you're thinking about these paintings? Because a lot of the photos are black and white, right? And, and why oil paint? Well, I mean, all, all the photos are black and white. If they weren't, mm -hmm. then they would kind of get in the way. But uh, uh, the oil paint, um, I mean, I like, you know, first of all, I mean, I think I think that uh, that there's probably a lot of paints that can do the same job. But for me, I started with oil paint, so I'm, I'm a very, like, you know, uh, kind of habitual person, so I just got used to it also. But I also like that, that it takes its time, you know, to dry. 
And, uh, and sometimes I, I apply paint in a lot of different ways. I'll do it thinly or very finely or just like the hand where I'll, I'll just take my hand and just, just, just scratch it on there. So it gives me a wide kind of range of how I want to do it. Uh, and uh, with the painting, I always start with a drawing underneath, uh, sort of like the skeleton of the painting, which sometimes I, is, is there to be seen and sometimes not. And, and I build off of that. So I'll do a first layer and then you know, I'll build certain areas or I'll scratch into certain areas. It's very like a visceral sort of process of like, the, there's a physicality kind of to it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you can really see that here. And and also in, um, I think the next painting that we have, which is called The Accused Woman. Um, yeah, right there, which I think, or at least when I was zooming into it earlier, I felt like some of the underdrawing was also coming through, or maybe you just have more um, kind of distinct markings on there and also some text. Um, but I, yeah, I was really curious about this one because uh, for one, you know, a lot of times in your paintings, the at least one of the characters are, um, or the, the figures are addressing sort of looking at the audience. Here we have the woman or the person just sort of looking down. Um, and there's a lot of specific elements there. Yeah, I guess this is. I I think I include this one just because it's a little it's a little bit odd. It's more yeah. introspective. It's very different. It's not really like confronting the audience, but the audience kind mm -hmm. of draws her like her you know her worries or you know whatever. Uh, but uh, this is uh, from uh, uh, the shaving of, of of the head after the Second World War during the Second World War of the French women. Uh, the French were occupied by the Germans, and uh, you know a lot of the humiliation of the occupation. I think was you know like you, you know like transferred onto the, the the collaborators, or especially the the horizontal collaborators of them. These women that you know supposedly had children or affairs or mm. or, gangs or resistance fighters or whatever. Uh, it was transposed onto this you know these. Uh, you know this other sect of, of of the French, and I think that's a that's a human kind of quality we have. There, where society kind of you know finds the scapegoat to be like, oh, you know, it, it's not us, it's not our natural narrative, it's it's them that's wrong or something. Mm -hmm. So, uh, I found this as a as a really great sort of idea or or example of that. Uh, so I painted this woman who just had the you know her head shaved, and I sort of transposed this this very strong arm. Uh, that has this red fist and on 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 the form it says hat because i was imagining that's what she would have to wear to to hide the fact that she got her right. head shaved so it's very sort of uh instinctive very quick ideas that just come up to me and and that's basically some of the ideas of the painting yeah i mean it seems like all of that really gets all of that trauma and then the, like the physical marking is absorbed and put upon the body um, which I think is a qual you know, something that um, is present in a lot of your work, right? Like the the psychological goings on of the person internally um, become sort of more evident through the markings you make, through the color palettes, um, things you choose to accentuate, etc. Well, that's my job. If I didn't do that, I wouldn't look good. Yeah. <laughs> um, making it right i'm taking whatever cycle and i'm trying to to figure out in in a sort of physical way with pain yeah so that's what i hope to do <laughs> yeah and scale wise this one okay this one is 34 by 50 but which is a little bit smaller than a lot of your paintings but um you do kind of have this this way of bringing people in through the scale right do you you kind of paint close to um one to one in terms of person size, or how do you go, how do you yes. go about that process? I always think I kind of paint homunculi,es which is like small versions of. Uh -huh. <laughs> uh, I don't know why that word uh, sticks with me from my from like my reading when I was I don't know how old. Uh, yeah, so they they are very close, and I also and and also um, they're they're their their eyes line is very close to the human eye line so they're very connected with you but it's it's very similar to a one-to-one -one ratio if not they're a bit smaller a bit mm. larger so uh yeah definitely you know you should feel somehow like some sort of connection in terms of scale as well right right yeah i think that really draws you in um 
And something that this, you talk about here, a little bit here, but also with the previous work, but um, is, is this idea of institutions and kind of nationalism and systems of power um, that, you know, can inflict violence or oppression. How, you know, how, what draw, drew you to, to kind of pick these images and, and suss that out? Um, because it, I think it's, con it's consistent throughout your paintings, this um, element of, of telling stories and, and kind of bringing up social justice as well. Um, I mean, I think I've always had a, a sort of, of uh, a, a sort of feeling for the uh, the importance of individuality. So I really I really like to focus on groups and the individual, or like how individuals are you know oppressed or you know you know by by groups, how groups are sort of initiated or how they're kept together, you know by creating you know, some, you know, some other with some sort of out group sort of bias. I mean, there's all sorts of ways that that sort of fascination between those two extremes between, you know, a, an individual, you know, kind of, you know, like, like a consciousness and, and society is to be kind of fascinating how that balances out and how, how, how people deal with that. And I, I, I address that, you know, just constantly in my work. Mm. And, uh, it, it, it probably has to do with my personality. Like I'm always very, <laughs> very, suspect of any institution or any group mm. or anything like that so i think that's just it's part of my personality and it just sort of a snowballed into a lot of paintings yeah <laughs> right which uh, i think the next one is a good example of of a large group of of people usually my larger work is about six by eight feet mm -hmm. and uh smaller ones are about six by four feet so that's usually my my range of work I, I, for the last at least few years. So. Yeah, and this one, which is called Contagion, which I think was sort of interesting to be looking at in these times, um, yeah. is it's you know instead of the singular figure, you have a whole group of people um, gathered at this bonfire, but they're sort of looking all looking at you. It's very um, arresting. What's what's the source yeah. or what's going on in this one? Uh, the source of pot is, is a pretty like popular image. Uh, it's uh, the burning of a Beatles album. I think it's like '66 or something. I think there was a, a big uprising when, like John Lennon. And I'm not, you know, I'm. I'm it, it's not a commentary on like the Beatles or anything. I just, uh, I, I just found the image arresting and the burning of any, uh, you know, artwork, whether it's text or whatever. That I, that's what interested me. Not, not any particular band, but. Um, um so yeah i think it was 66 when he said that the beatles are more famous than jesus or some like something to that effect and mm. there was a big uprising i think in some of the some of more like the bible belt states in the u.s and when they came on tour there this is kind of like they're protesting of like uh you know how could you possibly say that i think it was just uh sort of a way again of building unity between this sort of community of like let's destroy something let's be you know because it's a very aggressive violent image uh to create more harmony within this particular you know particular group uh which again those those sort of activities i find kind of really really interesting and very right. close to human nature so. right and something that maybe goes unconsciously a lot of the time you know the way that we act when we're with a group don't really question, but you see, you you really get into that in 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 these paintings, um, and yeah, I just keep going back to the eyes in this painting. Um, I'm curious about the audience, like who do you think about? You know, who will be looking at the work um, as you're working on it? Is that something that you're sort of thinking about when? when you're making something, are you addressing a certain public? Uh, yeah, I mean, like the like the first time I had like a show somewhere else in Europe, you're like, how would it be received? But, but no, when I'm making it, no, absolutely not. I, mm. it, it's only when it's done or where, where it ends up going, then then maybe. But I just find like this, these things sort of important and they're, they're brought up just sort of, they're, they're just, you know, just since you're, 
since your stimulus is, is, is the present moment, they just seem sort of necessary to make. So I don't really think of like, oh, I, I, I shouldn't make this because of so-and-so. I usually make it. And then once it's done or it's going somewhere, then maybe I'll think about it. But not, not mm -hmm. it's not at the beginning of the, of the work. Mm, interesting. Yeah, and I think also it, even with the few works that we've shown, you're consistently revisiting you know, moments from early 20th century history, um, which I think is sort of striking. It's very, it's sort of specific in that way. Um, is there a particular reason why you're, you're drawn or do you know why you're sort of drawn to that period of time or is it just um, the images that are accessible to you or what, what kind of made you pinpoint um, the 20th century and, and specifically America, I guess? Uh, well, I mean, for the, for the, the couple of shows I've done very recently, I've been, uh, very interested sort of reading like some, you know, economic texts and, uh, you know, disparities and, 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 and wealth and stuff. So I was very interested in, in pre-World War One sort of Edwardian English, um, images, just because I think there's, there's some sort of parallels going on then. Uh, but just in general, I think there is obviously a, a point of like access of these images are like available. And mm -hmm. uh, I, I think it's also more, you know, more like palatable to, to a modern, you know, to a contemporary audience that this sort of still makes sense instead of making some sort of image of some, you know, some knight on a horse or something, which is too metaphor, it's too abstract, too distant or something. I think these are still sort of you know, visceral things that you can okay. react to or, you know, something like that. So I think, uh, I think there's a, there's a wealth of, of, of things you can gather from, from the most mundane, you know, kind of rituals or, you know, from the 20th century. So I just, I've always used those. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So interesting. Cause they, yes, they do definitely feel familiar. Um, but I'm thinking also of, the the next work which i think is the last one we're going to be showing but this is the work that's at the at the bass um called boy with a flag of course the the american flag is very present in a lot of your paintings but just the image of this boy looked sort of familiar and the way that he's posed looks like a very traditional portrait um but I'm curious about like who, what do you know who this person was, and and when was it taken the photo, the original photo? Um, I don't know the exact person. I don't know, but I know that uh, there was a, a big sort of like propaganda of the U.S. entering World War One, which I think was like we entered about 1917. So this must have been taken either 1917 or 16 or something, something around there. And uh, yeah, I have, a, I have a lot of empathy for like especially children how they. Mm -hmm sort of get, um, you know, put into a system of, you know, ideology or structure. And I, and, and, and I love chairs because chairs is, you know, like he's, he's holding on to it as a, almost a balancing agent, you know, a balancing of a psyche or sort of a composition of a psyche. Mm -hmm. uh, so I like that very much, but yeah, I just, I, I, I think you have the empathy of him wearing this very heavy jacket, this large sort of, shoe, this peg leg, which is almost a hindrance of, you know, this maybe like trauma imposed upon him. And uh, there's, it, it's this burden on the psyche that he's going to have to deal with for the rest of his life and see mm -hmm. how he sort of, uh, you know, comes through his existence. So, uh, yeah, I really like this picture for that sense. He's just so, there, there's so much like, you know, the the floor's coming down so hard. He's holding on to things. He's holding on to a chair and a flag. And uh, I just like the sort of the um, what what that implies to to a psychological you know kind of state. Mm -hmm. And then and yet his you know through the eyes is just kind of like a bit blank, right? Like it you can it feels overwhelming, or you can kind of feel the at least in my interpretation the overwhelm of all the different things kind of stabilizing him and pulling him in various directions. Yeah, I think I think one of the things I always like to do if a, if a piece is, is is successful is that uh there's a lot of just energy pulling mm -hmm. 
sorts of directions. It somewhat harmonizes. I'm sure people don't, some people don't think it harmonizes, but uh, it pulls in all sorts of directions. And I think that's really interesting to like the tension that if you kind of analyze things that, you know, that, that people feel or that there is kind of inside them because there's so much that you have to sort of get through. And I think this one captures it, you know, pretty well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree. Um, great. Well, I just to pause a second to say if anybody has any questions, please feel free to put them in the chat. Don't be shy. Um, but while we wait for that, what are you what's what's next for you? The dreaded question. <laughs> what are you working on now? Do you have anything exciting? Um, or are you in a period of uh, in between? <laughs> um, I have uh, I, uh, there's there should be two pieces going to London Freeze. Oh right, that's now. coming up. Um, uh, yeah, with Spurs Gallery, which is in Beijing. Uh, I should have a piece in with with Dan Cameron in 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 Prospects. Nice. Um, I forgot the details. I'm sorry, I was I've been busy. And then <laughs> I think I have something. I have uh, some other pieces for Adela Sante in November or something. Uh, I have a solo show in Night Gallery in LA, and then I have some other stuff, but it's a little further down the line. So. Wow! So you're you're gearing up for a busy end of the year. Uh, well, I have to stay geared because yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, yes. Well, that sounds great, and. Um, Something I always ask other artists too, because it's it's a great answer every time. Is there anything that you are watching or consuming or reading, listening to that's been, I won't say inspiring, because I did read an interview with you where you said you didn't quite like that word, but um, you know that's kind of intriguing to you at the moment, <laughs> sticking with you. Well, I do my daily reading, so I don't know. <laughs> What's part of your daily reading? Is I don't it know, news or? Like really saying a particular thing, you sound like a, like an ass. I, I, <laughs> I'm going through. I'm going through the phenomenology of spirit, uh, which is Hegel. Um, I mean, I just I just finished a couple of books. I'm always reading two or three books, so I uh, I just I'll. I, I, I'd rather not say. If you I, dabble, you well, dabble around. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's a. It's important to to read those kind of like deep, more philosophical texts and and see where they, see where you land when you revisit them. Right. That's how I feel. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Good. Okay. Well, um, I don't see any questions in the chat. I think that. People must have been very satiated by everything you've said so far. Um, so I think That's it's my a effect good... on people. I, I, I have a <laughs> effect on people. <laughs> oh, you're too funny. Um, okay, well, I think that's a good spot to wrap up then. Um, thank you, Farley, for speaking with me. It was great to learn a little bit more about your work and um, everything you have going on. That's very exciting. We'll definitely stay tuned. And um, thanks again for everybody who tuned in for tonight's small talk um, and to other, the other ones that happened through this year. Stay tuned for more information about our programming. Um, and thanks again to Art Bridges for their support of the program. Awesome. Thanks, Farley. I'll talk to you soon. <laughs> Bye. -bye. <laughs> Bye.